About some of this discussion is uh, the U.S. Attorney for the Northern District, Bill Elenfeld. Bill, good morning. Welcome back to the program. Good morning, Rob. It's good to be back. Uh, you kind of caught part of that conversation out of context. John is an author, and at the recent, uh, this most recent hospice of the Panhandle uh, auction, Mike Height uh, won the bid to be knocked off in John Gilstrap's uh, newest book that is out. And I think Mike Kite built, it was $112,500, I think, is what it was. And, and, and counting, Rob. And counting. Yeah. It's going up every time I talk about that. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, Bill, um, I mean, it's kind of fascinating. Mike uh, Stewart had the comments uh, to start our show off in this segment. And I know he, he and Bill Powell and you uh, folks have all been uh, U.S. attorneys. And uh, it's a job that you've had uh, in between also serving in the West Virginia legislature, Bill. That's right. Yeah, I served originally as U.S. Attorney from 2010 until 2016, and then left the office, joined the legislature for a bit, and then returned to the U.S. Attorney's Office in 2021. It's not a, it's necessarily a political job, but it does change as administrations change, Bill, which makes it always interesting around election time, doesn't it? Yeah, you're right. It, well, there are politics involved uh, as far as uh, – who's appointed and, and when the appointments take place and, and who's in control of the White House. But once you get into the office, that all goes out the door and you just uh, – it's, it's a great job because you just have one client that you represent, and that's the United States of America, and you do do what's best for the country. And, and, and then, you know, you drill down a little bit more, and, and my focus is on – the Northern District of West Virginia, which is comprised of 32 counties to include the Eastern Panhandle. And so it, it does get interesting during election year, but I've been through it once before, and uh, I, I try not to pay too much attention to it. I just come to work and do my job, and there's an incredible staff that of career prosecutors that uh, will not change uh, regardless of what happens in the election in 24. What drew you back to the job bill after you had, after you had left it it was the best job i'd ever had and it's very rare in life that you get a chance to go back and do something that you love so much again and uh, i saw an opportunity uh, in in 2020 to do that i was in the legislature at the time and i was working in in private practice but saw an opportunity and so i put my name in and it worked out for me but it's just it's so rewarding it's something there's something new every day, you know. Every morning, uh, I, you know, I just before I came to work today, I'm looking at my emails before I came into the office and learned something new about a case that I'm I'm heavily involved in that just made my day, and and it hadn't even begun yet. Uh, and and there are tough days as well, and tough decisions and tough cases, but it's just so rewarding to be able to do this kind of work to know that you're protecting the communities that you care about. And and so when the opportunity came up, I decided I'd give it another shot, and and so I'm back, and it's it's been a great two years during this most recent run, and hopefully it'll last even longer. Bill, where, where would you rate uh, coming on this show when you look at your calendar in the morning as, as you wake up compared to the other news that you get? Where, where would you kind of put that appearance on this show along the good days ahead of me, kind of? Uh, well, I, I was looking forward to it all weekend. Uh, the only thing that that ranked higher was. The Steeler game, and if that Oof. didn't turn out very well for Oof. me, so this one moved up to the top of my list. Yeah, man, we were terrible yesterday. We were just terrible. I don't know what that was. Oh my gosh. Yeah, Bill, we going were. going back to uh, the change administration. Uh, do all the U.S. attorneys submit their letter of resignation when the administration is turned over? No. Sometimes uh, they're staggered, uh, and sometimes. Uh, U.S. attorneys are held over during a new administration for a variety of reasons. I mean, you're, you're probably aware of the U.S. attorney in Delaware. He's still uh, in, in office. He was appointed by President Trump, and that's because he's overseeing the Hunter Biden case. But there have been other U.S. attorneys who have been carried over for other reasons. Um, I, I, don't, I don't actually know the reasons why, but the U.S. attorney in Maryland carried over from Bush to Obama. The U.S. attorney in Louisiana carried over, I believe, from Bush to Obama. Um, and you know, I, I tendered my letter of resignation on December 31st of uh, 2016. Uh, I, I didn't wait to be told. I just I went ahead and tendered it because I, I felt it was the, the new president's uh, privilege to appoint someone new in my district. Others hung on and waited until uh, 
a Friday in March of 2017 to get a phone call being told that they were done that day. So I, I, I didn't wait around for that phone call. Bill, let's talk about this bust of uh, 26 involving uh, some people in, in the uh, drug trade in Martinsburg that recently came down from your office. That's right. So last week we unsealed an indictment involving 26 individuals who were involved in the trafficking, primarily methamphetamine, but also fentanyl, cocaine, heroin, and other drugs in the eastern panhandle. Uh, the primary source was out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, but we also had activity in, in Virginia and, of course, in West Virginia. And this spanned from, from Clarksburg over to, to Hampshire County and, and Berkeley County and Morgan County. We have uh, three individuals who are the primary uh, offenders, I guess. Uh, when you look at a federal indictment, typically those named at the top of an indictment are the most serious offenders. At least that's how we do it. And so we have the individual from Pittsburgh named at the top of the indictment, Dorian Burks, also known as Cash, and then two individuals, uh, Andrew Hose and John Malcolm, who are from West Virginia, who were also heavily involved. Uh, it was a, a really tremendous effort, not only by the Potomac Highlands Drug Task Force, but also the Eastern Panhandle Drug Task Force, and then law enforcement in both Pennsylvania and Virginia all coming together very quickly. Uh, the investigation uh, began earlier this year, and uh, it, it, it moved very quickly, and they were able to identify a total of 26 people, who uh, most of whom have been arrested and have appeared before a federal magistrate judge and will now uh, face uh, a trial or uh, perhaps uh, work out a, a plea agreement with my office. The Organized Crime Drug Task Enforcement uh, uh, Task Force was involved in this, too. Is that automatic in a multi-jurisdictional drug investigation, or was this uh, also something that you had to call in because there was more of an organized crime element to it? It's not automatic, yeah, and that's also known as OSADEF. It, it's for... Uh, more uh, more important cases, more significant cases. Not uh, every case is important. I, that's probably a, a poor term to use, but more significant cases. Um, call uh, in those those types. We will apply for it to receive OSADEF designation, uh, and and that helps with funding. Uh, it gives us some additional financial resources in order to more effectively pursue the the sophisticated organizations. And so that was uh, something we did here. Uh, these uh, the task forces um, don't have unlimited funds. Uh, we're, you know, we've got local sheriff's departments, the state police, uh, local p police departments that are part of this, and also the the FBI. Uh, but sometimes we need additional resources, and so that OSADEF designation can help. Bill. Yeah. Uh, good morning, Bill. Uh, looking at your uh, press release, I noticed the task force consisted of several, several different groups, including the FBI and the state police, the prosecuting attorney for Berkeley County. Absent from this group, though, was the sheriff's department in Berkeley County or the sheriff's department in Jefferson County. Was there any reason for those omissions? Uh, no. Uh, so this was there is a drug task force. It's a little bit confusing. Um, there's a drug task force known as the Eastern Panhandle Drug and Violent Crimes Task Force, and the Jefferson County Sheriff's Department and the Berkeley County Sheriff's Department are members of that task force. Potomac Highlands is uh, kind of falls under that umbrella, but is a separate unit. Uh, they're both considered FBI Safe Streets Task Forces, uh, but it operates separately. It's, uh, it's uh, based in uh, not in Martinsburg, um, but uh, over in Fort Ashby. And and so once in a while, those task forces do a lot of work together. And you might have seen Berkeley or Jefferson County Sheriff's deputies helping with a case like this. But but in this case, uh, it was it was a, a Potomac Highlands task force case. And 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 so it was not uh, not for any particular reason other than that that the Berkeley and Jefferson task force wasn't heavily involved. Uh, kind of a follow-up, if I may, very quickly. Uh, so these two task forces are standing task force, if you will, that they already had pre-existing individuals or organizations participating. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah, these task forces have been around for quite some time. Uh, they both receive funding from um, the High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area Program, or also known as HIDA. Uh, they they 
they work together very well, but they're separate. Uh, and, and, and the reason why we need two such significant drug task forces in that part of the state, it's I think the only part of the state that has a setup like this is just because of the the high volume of drug activity, the proximity to places like Baltimore and Washington, D.C., uh, Northern Virginia, and the whole East Coast. Uh, so uh, we've got two pretty significant drug task forces in that region that are under the same FBI Safe Streets Task Force umbrella, but operate separately. Uh, good morning, Bill. This is John Gilstrap. Uh, congratulations on the uh, on the in- indictment. It seems like it's a pretty broad spectrum of drugs, primarily uh, methamphetamine, but you also mentioned fe- um, fentanyl and some others in the in the press release. Do we know where the drugs originated that w- that was being so, trafficked? Yeah, thank you, John. Uh, yes, the 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 source uh, the, the the highest level we we attained in this particular investigation uh, was a, a source in Pittsburgh. His name is Dorian Burks. And and so and and he uh, he has been arrested and and we've executed uh, search warrants and and found additional uh, evidence of criminal activity when that was done with assistance from uh, law enforcement in Pennsylvania. But ultimately, we know that the source is from Mexico. Uh, Almost all of the drugs that end up in West Virginia uh, originate south of the border. Uh, In this investigation, uh, we did not. tie Mr. Burks back to to anyone else. Uh, we decided it was important to take this down, to arrest him, and to arrest everyone else. Sometimes uh, we go higher than that in an investigation. Uh, we, we might uh, go uh, to Texas or even further south, uh, and, and we, have, we have people that we um, indict and uh, and charge who are in other countries. Uh, we've got someone right now who uh, we believe is in Mexico that we've indicted here in northern West Virginia um, who uh, kind of has gone back and forth. Uh, but to answer your question, uh, the, the source of, of this, of the bulk of these drugs was from, from Pittsburgh, and that was Mr. Burks. Of, of the cartels that are, are sending drugs, I don't know if, how, how much they specialize, but of the cartels, is there one in particular that is, uh, is is the greatest problem in West Virginia in terms of the supply of drugs into West Virginia? There are two primary cartels that uh, we come across, so one being the Sinaloa cartel and the other being the CJNG cartel. Uh, those uh, they they have a major presence in Mexico. They also have a major presence in the United States, and uh, and so it. it it's sometimes difficult for us to distinguish uh, from which cartel the drugs have come from in any particular case. Sometimes we know uh, because of evidence that we've collected, because of statements made, because of people we've arrested. Other times we don't know. In this particular case, I don't know if we know um, which cartel was involved. Uh, ultimately, Mr. Burks uh, may decide to sit down and, and cooperate and tell us a little bit more. Uh, and, and we might discover that. Uh, but at this moment, I don't know which cartel was involved. Do you know how the drugs actually got to Pittsburgh? Is there a, a well-established uh, avenue or conveyor belt that they use? Uh, I'm not sure in this particular case. I can I can speak to that generally, though. Um, the what, what we see here is that drugs will typically get here through parcels or packages, uh, either uh, FedEx, UPS, or the United States Postal Service, uh, or uh, drugs will be delivered uh, by tractor trailer, uh, brought across the country uh, in in tractor trailers that we all see out on the highways that uh, are carrying legitimate goods, but there are also uh, illicit drugs that uh, truck drivers will add into their load and carry across the country to make extra money. Uh, we also see individuals who will themselves drive across the country to pick up drugs and bring them back. And uh, the more sophisticated individuals will have trap cars or cars that have containers that are very difficult for law enforcement to identify. So in case they are pulled over uh, and, and law enforcement searches their car, they're going to have a difficult time finding uh, the drugs. For Mr. Uh, Mr. Burks, I, I, I don't have the answer to that. I would say that 
my top prosecutor on the case, Laura Umpsbodeker, who is a, an absolute rock star in my office and, and, and is leading this case. She probably knows the answer to that, but I'm, I'm not into the weeds enough on this case to know uh, if we know uh, – where Mr. how Mr. Burks was receiving the drugs. Can I, I follow up to that if I can, Bill? Uh, where does technology lead us today? Are there sniffer devices that will be able to recognize drugs uh, similar to what a dog does or coming across the border? Understand there are methods to detect drugs coming across the border. Uh, where is the technology? And can we anticipate the technology become more sophisticated that will aid you and your staff in uh, intercepting these drugs? So the technology has improved. Uh, there's been more of an investment at the border uh, by Homeland Security and they are uh, better able to basically x-ray the the cars and trucks that are coming cr- across the border and they're able to identify uh, on a uh, more more successfully drugs that are contained within the vehicles that are coming across because ultimately that's where the vast majority of the drugs uh, are coming from that's how the vast majority of drugs are getting into the United States is through legal ports of entry However, uh, there, there's more work to be done, uh, and, and I'm told that there are, there are dollars that um, are available that haven't been invested yet uh, for whatever reason. Uh, but it's, it's not that Congress hasn't allocated money for that purpose. It has. Money has been invested. It's gotten better, but there are still uh, gaps in the system where drugs obviously can get across the border and, and get up uh, into the United States and um, and, and ultimately be dispersed across the country and come to places like West Virginia. You know, the other, the other big piece to this, though, are the parcels and, and packages, and we're doing a better job with that, but there's more work to be done there uh, with, with all the drugs that come in through the mail. Uh, so it's, a, it's very complicated, and I, I work uh, closely with the U.S. Postal Service, and we're actually we, – we just added an additional – agent from the, the Postal Service to the Eastern Panhandle, excuse me, Drug and Violent Crimes Task Force, so we can uh, be uh, do a little better in pulling, uh, identifying drugs that are coming through the mail. Uh, we, we see a tremendous amount of drugs coming through the mail, but we know we're not getting everything. And so that's why I reached out to Postal, and we actually work with Postal out of Pittsburgh. They cover uh, the Eastern Panhandle, and they've been kind enough to add an agent. So we're, we're hopeful that that's going to pay dividends. How active a partner is the Mexican government in in this? We know at least who some of the cartel members are, if not if not the leaders. Are they are, are they partners in our effort to shut this down? You know, lately they they seem to have become better partners, and that's one of the things that uh, is a key piece to this. Obviously, we've got to do what we're doing. But there's got to be diplomacy. And uh, just uh, over the past couple of months, uh, a couple of big things have happened. One, uh, one of the Chapitos, uh, and that's another way of saying the, the four sons of El Chapo. El Chapo's in, in federal prison in Colorado for the rest of his life. Well, his four sons took over the Sinaloa cartel when he was finally incarcerated. And one of his boys not only was arrested in Mexico, but he was actually extradited, and he's facing federal charges with the U.S. Attorney's Office in Chicago. Uh, He appeared in September. That's a big deal. And then just last week on Thanksgiving, the attorney general announced that the the head of security for the Sinaloa cartel has been arrested, and he's in the process of being extradited to the United States. That wouldn't have happened without – neither of those things would have happened without the help of the Mexican government. So it seems as if – uh, something has changed. I don't know exactly what has changed, but there have been a lot of conversations, and we're starting to see more cooperation. The U.S. Attorney for the Northern District, Billy Linfeld, is our guest here on the program as we get ready to wrap up our interview. I was looking at the list of those indicted among the 26 is a fair representation of women on this list, Bill. Has that become something that is now more common than it used to be maybe when you started it on this job? Uh, that's a good question. I, I'm not sure that uh, it's become more common. We've always seen women involved in drug trafficking. Uh, they're not all. They, they typically are not at the top of the indictment, as I mentioned earlier. But it's not unusual for them to play a role. Uh, so uh, I, I, 
I, we, we haven't tracked that. I, I don't know. Uh, mm-hmm. It's possible it's more common now, but I, I just not not a piece of data that I've tracked. Uh, in regards to the most of the people indicted, uh, would it be fair to say that most of them are also users of drugs, Bill, or are many of these just in the sales end of things? There's a combination. So th- there are certainly some people in that group who are users, and that's part of the reason that they're selling in order to have enough money uh, to supply their habit and and not um, – you know, not not go through withdrawal and everything else that happens when you stop using uh, these incredibly powerful drugs. But uh, there are others that are in it purely for profit, and and those would be those that you see closer to the top of the indictment. So it's a combination. Did any of these indictments involve anything in the more aggressive end of the line uh, for assaults or uh, murder or attempted murder? I'm not sure if, if any of these individuals have those types of charges in their background. Uh, many of them do have criminal histories. Uh, Mr. Hose uh, actually was on federal paper. He's from Bunker Hill. He's one of the primary defendants. He was on federal paper at the time that all of this was happening. So he's got a, a prior drug conviction. And, and so that's uh, not good for him when he faces sentencing this next time. Uh, assuming he's convicted, he's presumed innocent un- until and unless proven guilty. But if he's convicted, the fact that he was on supervised release, as we call it, at the time that he was engaged in this activity is not going to be a good thing for him. What Do, would, does, well, where did these are types of arrests, we have multiple people, does it filter back to the cartels? Uh, I'm not sure if it gets all the way back to the cartels. Uh, I do think that it, it gets around the region, and, and that's part of what uh, we're trying to do with these types of cases and these, these roundups is to make it clear that uh, – the Eastern Panhandle is not a good place to do business. We're trying to make it. We're trying to make it uncomfortable for these organizations to operate, and show that there is uh, considerable law enforcement presence in the area. So I, I do think it gets around regionally. Uh, I'm not sure that those in at the the highest levels of the cartel really worry too much about what we're doing here, uh, in part because they don't plan to come here. Uh, they plan to uh, keep a, a nice distance from the U.S. if they can and operate from south of the border where they're making enormous profits. I mean, the profits are just spectacular, and they're not concerned about individuals up here getting arrested and incarcerated. Do you have time for a final question, Bill? Yeah, Bill, what would be the typical sentence one of these 26 people might be facing? So it, it depends upon the amount of drug weight that they that, that we can prove they distributed. Uh, because we're dealing with methamphetamine here, uh, the sentences are going to be more significant because the federal sentencing guidelines call for longer sentences for that particular drug. And so some of these individuals uh, may receive 20 years in prison. Uh, I, I expect that several of them will receive uh, 10 years or more in prison because of the fact that methamphetamine is involved. And it doesn't take very much methamphetamine to to render uh, to, to generate a long sentence and then their criminal histories also play a big role so someone like mr hose will expect a longer sentence because he's got a, a at least one prior felony conviction maybe more bill thanks so much for your time this morning as always greatly appreciated thank you all Take thanks care. bill